Uh, glad to be here today in, in church. Uh, thank you for the live audience for joining with us today in our, our congregation here uh, in the former Eden Mall. Uh, we'd like if y'all came in and joined us one day. Um, this week, we're going to be continue, continuing our sermon series through 1 Thessalonians. Uh, the, the name of the series is Comfort One Another in Hope. And we're going to be talking about young, how a young church comforts and encourages other Christians and uh, non-believers with the example set by Paul and Thessalonians. Uh, so last week, we opened up with verses 1 through 3, uh, specifically in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Sorry, that's a mouthful. And today, we're going to be working through select passages each week through each chapter of uh, Thessalonians. So I'll catch y'all up on what ha what continued to happen to 1 Thessalonians 1, and we're going to find ourselves in 1 Thessalonians 2 today. So in the prior sermon, uh, we were discussing how uh, Paul went about comforting other Christians, uh, particularly through his greeting. Uh, we saw that Paul offered them a blessing, that he affirmed them in the good work that they were doing, and he showed his appreciation to them. Why did he do this? Well, the church was being persecuted. Uh, we discussed in context that the church of uh, Thessalonica was a young church that had lost their leadership. Uh, he was kicked out of town. Paul uh, was removed. He went. There was a riot, and this church was being persecuted. They were being beaten. Um, about as awful as you can imagine there. So the church was persecuted. And now, uh, moving on, we're going to talk about the message that they were being persecuted for. Um, as 1 Thessalonians went on, uh, Paul, y'all can see in verse 5 through 9, uh, Paul talks about the powerful gospel. He says that the gospel, this good message that they uh, had, had arrived in power by the Holy Spirit. And he discusses that when one believes on this gospel, that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again, uh, that they had this, uh, something called assurance. We talked about in Sunday school, actually, uh, assurance in the things that result of this gospel. Now, what is assurance? Assurance simply is you can be sure that you are saved. Yeah. You, don't have to, you don't have to worry um, about your, your standing no more or who you are in Christ. So when you believe in the gospel, Paul says, you can have assurance. You're eternally sealed. So with this good news in mind, the church went out into their community, and they became examples. They became patterns uh, into the world following after Paul and the message that he brought. So they had this good news. They had assurance. So they went out and became examples uh, to other Christians. They had joy in a very unjoyful world. Despite of their circumstances, despite the troubles that they was going through, they was literally being beaten. Um, they, some pretty awful things were being said to them, um, but they were still being a joyful example despite it. So your joy will be noticeable only in the light of Scripture. Okay, so well, your joy will be noticeable, but it's only effective in the light of Scripture. If it's joy without taking the word out there of why you're joyful. Then uh, I, I can. Just, I think it's safe to say that you're falling short on what um, God has called us to do. So be verbal about your faith. This is where I'm going to leave um, chapter one. The Thessalonians' faith was joy in action. They were living with the hope of Christ's return. So that takes us to today's scripture uh, to summarize a little bit of what happened after last week's message, and we're going to begin reading. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12. I'll give you a moment to turn there. That's page 581. Thank you. So, uh, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know. At Philippi, we were bold in God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. 
For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanliness, nor in God. But as we were allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tried our hearts. For neither at any time used we any flattering words, uh, as you know, or a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, and we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse, a nurse cherished her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have parted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly... I'm going to read one that there. I want you all to pay attention to verse 10 through 12, okay? Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameable we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father to with his children, that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. So in uh, verse 1, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, we had the church that was going out and being examples to other people. So now Paul is discussing how he brought the message to the Thessalonians. Uh, he uses words such as gentle, as a nurse, a nurse, uh, nurse cherishes her children. He said he was uh, affectionate, desirous, uh, a, a lot of positivity there, okay? Now, come to verse 10. This is where we're going to center today. Uh, ver uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 10. It says, Ye are witnesses in God also, how holy and justly and unblameably, unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. So, I want to take those three words, and we're going to break, uh, break them down, what they mean, and how this pertains to us as Christians who are follow, uh, following this pattern. This first word, holy, it says focus on, uh, so we're going to focus on verse 10 through 12. There's three characteristics of behavior here. We have holy, justly, and unblameably. Paul describes his first behavior as holy. Now, the, uh, the word here is pretty interesting. It, it literally means pure from evil conduct. Or observant of God's will. I, I like uh, in Sunday school, um, we, we discussed a lot of the verses I'm going to discuss today. And as we talk about God's will, God's will isn't hidden. It's here in Scripture. He makes it obvious to us all. Uh, he said it, it's the will of God that all will be saved. And that's where we're, we're going to land today with that word. So it's pure from evil conduct when we talk about holy and in this uh, context. And observant of God's will. Living holy is only possible when we have the Holy Spirit, when you are saved. Okay, so Paul here is speaking to other Christians. And it's only, uh, the behavior is only possible in, uh, by Christ's righteousness, and it's only trainable in two ways. Okay, so y'all might want to write these down if y'all are taking notes. The first thing is study. You're filling up with instruction on righteousness, learning how to do right in God's eyes. Okay, so we study the scripture uh, as laid before us, um, and if y'all want to turn with me to 2 Timothy 2.15, we'll see what this looks like. Page 585. Today specifically, we're talking about conduct as we bring encouragement, comfort, and the gospel to other people. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to go on to verse 16. It says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more godliness. So it's pretty simple. These are the two instructions that we have. First of all, fill yourself up with the word of God, rightly divided. We'll get more into that here soon. So you're filling yourself up with an instruction for righteousness. Go to verse 16. Our second instruction is the opposite. Shun and avoid vain babblings and fables. So things that are not of God, simply avoid. 
that, that's our two instructions um, to live holy, as uh, Paul is discussing here in 1 Thessalonians 2. So God's word increases godliness. Worldly knowledge increases ungodliness. It, it's uh, a, a pretty, pretty simple instruction. Increase in one way, decrease in the other. So being holy, it, it, the definition means many things. But one thing is a state of living. Uh, God would t turn to 2 Corinthians 5.21, and I'll give you a moment to get there. We're taking a little journey through Scripture. It's page 571. What chapter and verse? It's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Okay, so we're talking about uh, Paul's adjective of holy as a state of living. So here, as we go to uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he hath made him to be sins for us who, know, who knew no sins, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So a lot of times uh, in Romans you see this term as imputed righteousness. Now, I love speaking on imputed righteousness uh, because it very seriously um, has something to do with us. So we talk about imputed righteousness, we talk about being blanketed in righteousness. Do y'all recall when y'all was a kid and y'all make a fort out of blankets or pillows or whatever it is? This is kind of the same concept. You go and you hide under that and you're covered. So when y'all hear imputed righteousness, I want y'all to think of being blanketed by something. You're literally being blanketed by Christ's righteousness. So as Christ looks to us, uh, 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 as God looks on us, he sees his son Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Uh, it's, it's a very important concept because from here, this is the start of what it means to live holy. Amen. So we are set apart and made holy by what Christ did for us. Uh, the term holy means being set apart. And we have a manual on how to be set apart. In any occupation that you have, or most occupations, as when you get that job, you're set apart for that duty. And then the thing, what goes on from there is you're trained. You're given a manual of instruction. It, in a similar way, that's uh, what the Word of God is to us. It teaches us how to increase unto godliness. Moving on to my next point. So we're supposed to live holy, set apart, living by uh, God's instruction. Next, Paul uh, states that he came to the uh, church in Be uh, Thessalonica justly. It says, Your witnesses and God also, how holy and justly and unblamingly. This word is closely correlated uh, to the word holy and righteous. In fact, in Old English, when we got the word uh, justified in English, it meant right-wise. Okay? Uh, the word righteous goes down to right-wise. It's literally a state of being right. Something that I'm never with having. So. <laughs> that, that, that in there. But, so remember, no one, we talk about imputed righteousness, no one uh, is right apart from God when they're not blanketed in his righteousness. Because God is truth. He is that righteousness. Since God is and the origin of truth, we must live by his truth because there's no truth apart from God. Unfortunately, we were born fallen. When Adam and Eve uh, partook of the first sin, that lineage goes down and we're born in this icky, depraved state. Now, in the age of grace, so Jesus came, we've discussed this, he died, buried, rose again, we believe on that, we're blanketed in his righteousness, y'all see where I'm going with this. He has made a way for us to be right, right-wise with God, and he's given us a perfect word to live by. If y'all would, turn back to Romans 3, 22 through 26, and we'll see what it looks like to be right or made right with God. And do you have the page in your house for Romans 3? Romans 3, you said? 
Romans 3, 22 through 26. 554. What a good guess. I forgot what the name chapter was. It's chapter 3, right? Chapter 3, yes ma'am. 322 through 26. It says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there we are. We're reading about this depravity, this, uh, for lack of a better word, icky state that we were born into. Apart from God, we weren't right. So moving on, he says, Now being justified, made rightwise, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he, uh, that he might be just and the justifier of him uh, which believeth in Jesus Christ. So we have this blanket of righteousness uh, upon us, um, that when God looks at us, well, we're deemed right. Now, moving forward in there, we're justified. We can live in a, in a holy manner um, in God's grace and his truth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's John 1, 17. The next adjective, so we have holy. We have justly. Two words closely correlated. Now we have unblameable. We're going to see how this ties in as well. When somebody is unblameable, this means that no charge can be held against them. So this is actually a judicial term. Sometimes you'll see it, you may see this in the courtroom or a court situation. When somebody is unblameable, you cannot hold them to a crime that you're trying to hold them to. Which Christ, uh, Christ's righteousness, I'm going to keep focusing on that, it, uh, it leaves us unblameable. Now in the Bible, you can be unblameable to two people. First of all, or we need to be unblameable to two people. First of all, in the root of it all, unblameable to God, which is only possible by uh, his son's gospel. But also, in the Bible, it's, it talks about being unblameable to other people. As discussed earlier, Christ's righteousness makes us blameless before God. Now, living unto God and his holy word makes us unblameable unto other people. I have an example of this. Uh, y'all can turn there if y'all want. Uh, y'all don't have to. If y'all uh, don't want to, I'm going to summarize it. In 1 Timothy 2, it talks about the requirements for a pastor. Now, in context, as you look at that, it's talking about being unblameable to other people. As the congregation looks up and, uh, to, to their pastor, this is what a pastor looks like, his life, uh, when viewed by the congregation. It says that he's above uh, reproach. He's a, 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 wife, a, a husband of one wife, keeps his uh, children in order, and so on, so on. If those requirements aren't met, then he is blamable, and he's not qualified uh, for the position of pastor. So we're unblameable to two people, God and other people. As we take the gospel out, uh, just like Paul did to the Thess uh, church of Thessalonians, he was unblameable before two congregations. Uh, first of all, to God, then to people. But what's always interested me is how much of a change was necessary for Paul to be considered un un unblameable. When he was saved, he was unblameable to God. But here's the interesting thing. Paul was originally a terrorist. And I'm not saying that loosely. He would actually go around uh, uh, when he was a Jewish uh, teacher, and he would kill Christians, persecute Christians. Um, he was, in a very little sense of the word, a terrorist. So as he uh, was converted, he lived unto the word of God and the instruction that he was given. And he became un unblameable for other men. And he could say that boldly. He could say that proudly. And that's what the gospel does uh, for people. It makes you a new creation in a very literal sense of the word. So, it re uh, as a Christian witness, as we take the gospel to other people, it requires the same integrity. It requires the same diligence uh, as Paul had unto the uh, Thessalonian church. And then so forth, so forth. The Thessalonian church took that witness and they took and spoke to other people. Now, my encouragement here to, uh, to make this practical, no matter where you are in your Christian walk, 
We talk about once again, I'm going back to Sunday school. Papa took a lot of my material. So. Um, in Sunday school, our standing is always going to be secured, blanketed in Christ's righteousness. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, no matter where you are in your Christian walk, this is your state, your state of living now. Um, I once heard it said that you cannot lose your salvation, but you can lose your faith. Where are you in your faith right now? So no matter where you are in your Christian walk, you can pursue a worthy walk and look forward to your high calling, living holy, justly, and unblameably for other people. And uh, for the high calling, I reference Philippians 3.14, if y'all uh, want to write that down. We have a high calling as Christians um, that uh, we need to live unto, but we can't do it apart from the Word of God and who He says that we are. So, uh, my challenge to us today is to pursue a holy, just, and unblameable lifestyle so that we too can enrich the believer. That's what hopefully I'm doing here today is enriching the believer, building y'all up in Christ through God's word and by faith. So enrich the believer and bring the unbeliever to Christ. As we go out into the community, as we have conversations with people, uh, living this way, uh, I, had a, I had a note here uh, that I read. Um, the result of true, uh, the result of true, um, truthfully delivering the gospel is a truthful conversion with righteous consequences. Now, I always, I always found that interesting. Um, and so, as you truthfully deliver the gospel, as you truthfully live unto the gospel, um, you'll be true to the gospel and what it really is. Um, there's an illustration that I had I found very interesting. How many of y'all like rats? Anybody here like rats? Nobody? What about weasels? Ferrets. My brother has a ferret. There is a weasel like animal. And I'm going to close, uh, close with this now. There's a weasel-like animal in Asia and Europe. In fact, this animal is actually on the fur of Queen Elizabeth's crown. It's called an ermine. Now, the ermine, uh, towards winter, develops this beautiful white coat. It basically, just think of weasel. Don't worry about the name right now. So during the winter, it develops this white coat, and it will defend it with everything that it has. It does not want to get dirty. So hunters in the 1800s, what they would do is, to catch this animal, they would put mud on its den where it lived. And then they would chase the, uh, the ermine. When the ermine got to this house, it would not go into the house. It would rather die than soil its white coat. This was something very uh, interesting to me, and it, it, was, it was very sad. I was looking at the old videos, and they had stacks of ermines. But I thought that was a good illustration of our Christian witness, as we live holy, justly, and unblameable, living unto God. Defend your purity by scripture, uh, with scripture and faith, and uh, people will notice that as you take the gospel to them, and you can truthfully deliver it to them. I thought this was a fitting symbol uh, for a Christian and to close with, and to compare holiness to, uh, that we would uh, rather die than live apart from what God has in store for us. If y'all would, is there any prayer requests before I close? I praise that Papa is feeling better. Amen. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, Father. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you uh, for bringing us here together, Father, to worship you uh, in grace and truth, Father, which you are grace and truth. We just ask that you uh, that you uh, watch over us as we leave here today, Father, knowing that uh, you're not going anywhere from us, Father, who um, your Holy Spirit dwells and lives in. Thank you for your word and help us to live uh, by it, Father, living being examples that are living holy and justly and unblameable before you and others. I ask this all in the holy, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, is there any questions or comments? Oh, oh, oh no, uh, oh, question or comments. Um, would you like to, uh, Thank you for viewing today with the uh, live stream. We're going to cut the uh, live stream off so we can have um, sincere and honest uh, conversations about any questions or anything that needs to be discussed. But thank you for viewing. Uh, we Michael also, Bryant said, awesome young man, we miss him. Oh, hey, thank you, Michael. I, I love y'all. 
And uh, I hope that church went well for, uh, for y'all today and continues through the children's ministry. Thank you for all that you've done, uh, done for me. And